Okay, looks like we're recording. Okay. Um, so I do kind of have a list here. Let me see if I've got a little mark here that of what I, I want to cover um, today. Um, I want to talk about creating an acquisition for an existing item. Um, you know, most of the time you're creating an item and, you know, the acquisition is created at the same time. Um, but what if you need to go in later and create an additional acquisition or you just created the item with an acquisition and you have a few more items on the pending plate? You want to add to that existing tag. Um, and what um, would that do if the item was capitalized and you added an item? Um, or if it wasn't capitalized and then you add an item um, and now it's capitalized, what would that look like on some of the gap reports? So I just want to kind of go through that with you um, and just talk about what changes take place when that happens. <clears throat> also, we're going to cover splitting an item and just the steps. You know, um, you may not get that question often. But, um, or maybe you just don't feel quite comfortable and you feel like you have to go in and do it yourself, right? Before <laughs> you help a, a district with it. Um, so uh, we wanted to cover that, you know, and just do a split. And the way that the updates that we made on the splits this past year is pretty cool. I, I like how it splits now. It reminds me more of how it split in classic, but with even more flexibility. So we'll talk about that. And then we will also talk about splitting an item and disposing part of it. Um, this too is nice in, e in I was going to say ESS, in inventory, um, because uh, it's a little more flexible than what it was in classic. Um, and so we'll talk about, you know, an item that's been split and you're splitting it because you want to dispose part of it. Maybe you have a lot of chairs or something like that. And you're like, 10 of them were destroyed. I need to get rid of those 10 from that one tag that has that lot. So we're going to go through that. Um, Re-adding an item, <clears throat> excuse me, that was disposed of, you know, how, when can I do that? Um, you know, prior year versus current year. Uh, air adjustments. If you're not real comfortable with what an air adjustment is, why you would use it, and what it looks like on the reports. We're gonna talk about that. Uh, why isn't an item showing up on my pending list? Uh, we do get those questions, those tickets every once in a while. And we're just gonna go over the statuses in USAS and, um, you know, because uh, inventory is talking to USAS. And depending on the status of that inventory status of that item in USAS, it may not get pulled in. So we're gonna talk about those statuses. We're gonna talk about construction and, and progress items um, and items, the fund on the item versus the fund on the acquisition record and when you would need to use one versus the other and why. Uh, talk about deleted items. And then we're gonna talk about, um, I think I missed one here, uh, adding an item um, and having it, added uh, several acquisitions to one item versus uh, adding them separately. And I think I've got one more down here, I forgot. And I think that's donated items. Um, yes, I missed number 11, donated items. So um, we're just gonna talk about um, what is involved when um, a district does receive a donation and how do they track that in inventory. So those are the things we're going to cover today. So like I said, please feel free um, to ask any questions along the way. Okay, go ahead and we'll get started here. Go back up. Got my little guide here to kind of show me some tags here of, of uh, information that we can cover here. Okay, so um, creating an acquisition for an existing item. So I'm just going to pull an item up and do this visually here. And so this is the item that I have, and it's um, an intercom system. And I'm just going to click on it to view it a little bit better here. And 
in here, um, when I look at it here, it's just, you know, it's giving me the information for it. It's uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to add um, an additional acquisition to it is what I'd like to do. Um, I need to upgrade it. And, and, and the way to do that is I just can't go in and edit the original cost. It's not going to let me, you know, this could be an item from a year ago, um, from a period that I've archived already or closed. So, um, you know, I can't just go in and edit the original cost that would mess up gap schedules and balances and all of that good stuff. So what I want to do really is I want to add additional acquisition to this item in order to increase the original cost. So, you know, if, you know, I'm in fiscal year 24 in this test account here. And so um, I, my acquisition is for this year. Um, it's within this current year. And so the easiest way for me to go in and add an additional acquisition is I can do it here in the item uh, window here. Um, you know, I went in and viewed it. And what I kind of like about going into the item and viewing it is um, because I can see, you know, is this a capitalized asset? Because that just kind of in the back of my mind, you know, if this if this additional acquisition affects the capitalization status, I kind of want to know that ahead of time because I know then that this could affect my uh, gap reports, my schedule changed and fixed assets. So. Um, you can't see that capitalized status on the acquisition grid, but you can in the item grid. So that's maybe one of the reasons why, but you can go into transactions, acquisitions, and add an additional acquisition to an existing item in there as well. So my tag number is 201137. Like I said, um, it is capitalized. So I am increasing the original cost of it. Um, so I really don't, you know, it's not going to affect too much um, other than um, creating an additional, uh, increasing my original cost and creating an additional acquisition amount um, on my on my schedule change and fixed assets. So let's talk about that. So if I want to go in and like I said, I'm going to view it. And, you know, this was an item that was purchased um, in a prior year. And so I want to add an acquisition because I'm upgrading it in this current year. So I click on add acquisition and I can use the pending file in here um, to pull that information in or I can add it in manually. I have one here. I really like how you can just filter here, get the information that you need. Um, and so this is the uh, acquisition that I wanna pull in. And so I'm gonna go ahead and pull that in. And it does pull all the information in, in here. And um, the one thing it did remove was my, my existing tag number. So, so I do have to add that in again. Um, so it was 201137. The date is within my current year that's open. And here's the purchase order account that it pulled in. And then the vendor information, um, the purchase order information, the amount, so again, by having that item open and be able to add the acquisition in there, I can kind of look in the background here and see, oh, okay, my original cost was $83.90. I'm going to increase this by $41.51. So we're looking at, you know, $12,000 here that my new original cost is going to be. And you notice also, too, that it does say update original cost. It does that automatically. Um, you can uncheck that if you needed to, but um, in this case, we're doing an upgrade. So we want to increase the original cost. So that's really all I need. I'm going to go ahead and click on create. And it is going to create that acquisition. Remember, I'm still in the items grid here. So um, what I'm going to see here, the only major difference is my original cost. Like I said, it's, I couldn't do the math. I thought it was like 12,700 or something, but it's 12,500. Um, and so it, it did increase that by the amount of that acquisition. My capitalization status didn't change, obviously. It was capitalized to begin with. And uh, what I did then is I just went in and increased it. So it's still capitalized. 
And then if I wanted to go in and actually look at the acquisitions that make up that item, I can close out of here. And I can go in to the acquisition. And I can see um, that new acquisition that was I was added. So now I have two acquisitions against that item. So when running, um, I'm just going to run a quick uh, schedule change, and I'm just going to pick on the fixed assets one, just because we can see the changes that take place. And I'm just going to pick asset. This tends to be the one I, I choose just because um, you don't have as many asset classes maybe as you do functions and funds. So you usually get everything on one page of the report. And I'm picking on a summary because I want to see columns of data. I'm going to let that generate here. Came up quick. And make this a little bit bigger here for you guys. And so what happens is um, that item was already capitalized, right? It had the about $8,000. And so that was part of the beginning balance. But what I've done is I went in and added an additional acquisition to it. So it's not gonna affect the beginning balance. The beginning balance stays put uh, because the beginning balance is telling me at the beginning of the year for this item, you had $8,000. Um, and so that part is going to be included in this area here. But I went in and then added an additional acquisition and it was thrown into one of these here. Um, and it was uh, $4,000. And so what that's going to do, then it's going to show that part in my acquisition amount. I did an additional acquisition for the current year. So that change then in my original cost then is going to be reflected that additional acquisition in my acquisition amount. And so thus then my ending balance is going to include that beginning amount plus my additional acquisition to equal, you know, that, you know, the $12,000 for the original cost. So that's kind of how that's reflected um, when you're going in and uh, creating additional acquisition against an item that was added in a prior year. Okay, any questions on that particular one? I'm going to give you guys a few scenarios here. And I'm going to leave this um, report up because I'm going to explain some of these other scenarios that can happen here. Um, so, you know, this was an example as if the item was already capitalized and you added an additional acquisition onto it, right? So explain that. Now, if the item will now become capitalized, so let's say you went in and created an additional acquisition against an item that wasn't capitalized at the beginning of the year, okay? So let's say we'll use the same um, example. So to have a pretty high capitalization threshold, um, and I went in, um, let's say my threshold is $10,000. Um, and I, you know, already had an item, $8,000 from a prior year that I added that was not capitalized. When I look at the item, it's the capitalization checkbox isn't marked. And now I go in and I add an additional acquisition this year for $4,000. Now it's over that capitalization threshold amount of $10,000 is $12,000. So what happens now on my gap schedule. So I would do those same steps that I did before. Um, but when I look at my uh, summary uh, schedule in fixed assets, my changes here, it's going to be slightly different. Um, again, that amount of $8,000, because it wasn't capitalized, obviously will not be included in the beginning value. Um, it wasn't capitalized asset at the beginning of the year. It is now because I added an additional acquisition to it. So that acquisition amount is going to appear in the acquisition of the $4,000 is still going to appear in the acquisition column, but the rest, that $8,000 is going to come over and be displayed in the adjustment column. Because so I've got the 4,000 there, I have the 8,000, 
as an adjustment to say, hey, this item's now capitalized. Where do you want me to put this? Because really, $80,000 was acquired in a prior year. So it's not considered a true acquisition this year. Um, I'm going to pull that into the adjustment amount. So the $4,000 plus the $8,000 then equals my $12,000 that's going to show in the ending balance. And obviously, that item then is also going to be checkmarked that it's capitalized. So that's the big difference between if it's already capitalized versus if um, it's now going to be capitalized because of the upgrade that I made to that item. So that's kind of how that, that, that works on the uh, schedule change and fixed assets report. So what if I wanted to, you know, here I created the item, the additional acquisition this year. Um, and, you know, it does reflect correctly, you know, everywhere. So it's, it, you know, you're in good shape. Um, but if you really wanted to go in and add that acquisition in the prior year, so let's say I'm in here um, and, you know, I'm like, you know, I do have this additional acquisition that I want to add. And I added the item last year and I really want and, and it wasn't more of an upgrade per se, it was like a, a maybe a mistake or, you know, it really should have been added in a prior year uh, along with when you created that tag. And uh, so you want it to show in that prior year. Well, you could open that year, uh, reopen that year if you wanted to. Um, and then you would go in and create that acquisition against that existing item. And so um, when you do that, um, just kind of looking at the um, the report again. So basically, you would do those same steps um, because you have that period reopened. Um, you would go in and create that acquisition or that existing tag, um, and you know enter in all the information. And when you run uh, the schedule of change and fixed assets, and your that period is open, and that's your current period now. Um, then again, it's going to show that amount underneath the acquisition amount. Um, and so that one thing you want to keep in mind with that type of um, scenario is that, you know, you're in that prior year, you close the year, then reclose that year. And those beginning balances that you had in, let's say, 2024, are, not get, are now going to be different, right? Because you went back into 2023, you affected uh, the schedule of change in fixed assets by adding that additional acquisition to that item. Then, you know, it, you're, when you close again, um, you're going to have a new beginning balance for 2024. So that's just something to keep in mind. You can do it, but it's going to affect um, those reports that you already ran for the year. So it's just a matter of, you know, when you reclose, obviously it runs the fiscal year in bundle. Um, and then the, those figures are just going to be different because you've increased the beginning balance for that new year. Um, so some people don't want to do that, right? They're like, no, I'm not going to reopen my, my year. I just want to go in and add it in the current year. And even though it should have been something that should have been done in the prior year. That acquisition should have been added in the prior year. It wasn't for a purchase order in the current year, it was for the prior year. And I need to pull that in. What you can do is, you know, leave the period as it is. You're in fiscal year 2024. You're not reopening 2023. What you're going to do then is you're going to go in here and you're going to do the same steps. You're going to go in and you're going to create that acquisition um, for that item. Um, but the one thing that you want to keep in mind is that when you create that acquisition, um, there is an error adjustment option that you can select. And so what happens then is when you create that acquisition and, um, you, and you know, obviously you're in 2024, you have to use an acquisition date in 2024 in order for the acquisition to get posted, but really it should have been one for 2023. Don't wanna reopen my year. So instead, I'm gonna mark that acquisition with the error adjustment, check that. 
And then what happens then, again, I'm using a capitalized asset example, is when you go into this report again, um, that acquisition amount, because you set the error adjustment, is going to be reflected in the adjustment column, not the acquisition column. You're basically telling the report or the system, I should have added this, added this acquisition last year. I didn't, I don't want to reopen the period, but I want it to be reflected as an adjustment on the item. That is a true acquisition this year because it wasn't. It was, should have been done in a prior year. So that acquisition amount is going to show here. So again, you have, you know, using our example, $8,000 here, beginning balance, because it was capitalized at the beginning of the year. You made an adjustment of $4,000, something that should have been done in a prior year to equal your $12,000 that goes into the ending balance. So, um, so I thought it was just, you know, kind of good just to go over those with you guys and just explain, especially with a capitalized asset, how it affects these reports when you're making adjustments basically to the original cost of a capitalized asset. Um, and so these are all explained um, in, I believe, our FAQ page. It just doesn't happen very often, um, but so that's why I wanted to explain it to you guys. Um, but it does go through some of these scenarios in there as well. Okay, any questions regarding basically uh, adjusting in our in original cost? Okay, all right. The next thing I'm going to talk about is splitting an item, and I I like the splits. And like I said, I it's kind of the one of our newer features in inventory, and I I just think it's pretty cool. So, um, so what we're going to do is I know we do have a we have a, a issue right now that needs to be created about the splits dropping a leading zero. Uh, when it's trying to split out the inventory tag numbers, and I think that's going to be on the next release, I'm pretty sure. I, um, I think I have it marked down here. Uh, it's your issue 560. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. We are working on that um, so that those leading zeros don't get dropped uh, when you're trying to um, split out uh, tag numbers. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick on a existing tag that I have. And let's just view this. And so this is, um, yeah, I don't have a description here. Uh, let's make one up. <laughs> let's say this is benches. I forgot to add a description. Um, and what I wanna do is I look here and the number of items is 12. Um, it is capitalized, it's over the threshold. Um, uh, $30,000 is the full amount. But as you can see, we have a lot of 12. And I want to split that out. And what I like about inventory with the splits is that let's say I want to split these benches um, in between the elementary, junior high, and high school. Okay. But I, I don't want to split them evenly because the high school needs more than the elementary. And what's neat about the split is it lets you do it that way. Um, that was always a, a rough one um, to do in classic, I, I don't, or maybe it's just easier to do in inventory. Um, but I want to kind of show you how you go about doing that. And then we'll do an example after that of how to splitting out and disposing a part of one. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click on uh, the split feature here. And so the first thing it's going to ask me for is it's going to ask me for the starting tag number. Now, one thing to keep in mind is if you want to leave the starting tag number um, as your original number, you can, but... If you have tag numbers right after that, that'll already exist on the system, like 201172, 7374, they're gonna get an error. Um, it, the system can't skip over those to find a set of tag numbers. Um, and so you do have to go in, you, you know, know that you do have numbers after this that already exist. Then you probably wanna go in here to uh, change this up a little bit. To be honest, I can't remember if I do. So I'm just going to put in an extra one here um, in order to avoid that error. 
Um, and what's nice is that it tells me it's, um, it's, uh, I can, it's telling me I have 12 items, uh, which is cool because if, you know, when I'm looking, it's hidden behind this window, I'm like, how many items did I have in there? I have 12 uh, that I need to split out. And it also tells me what my original cost is, which I can kind of see down here as well. And what I want to do first is I want to put out the number of tags. So I've got three buildings that I want these benches to be placed in. And so I'm going to create three tags for those buildings. I don't want to split out and create a tag for each building. I want to keep them together as a location. Um, so that's why I've got elementary, junior high, high school. I'm going to split them out into three separate ones. And the first thing it's going to have me do is just a projection. Like it's, you know, making sure that this tag number I'm here is going to work and that the tag numbers after that are available. And so I'm just going to click validate input and I didn't get an error. So I get the green light basically that I can split tag if I want to now. They don't yet because I want a certain number of benches to go into each building and I wanna be able to control that. So I'm gonna click on edit items and what it's gonna do is it's going to pop up um, those three tags that I'm planning to split it into. And you'll notice the tag numbers that are assigned to it and it splits it evenly, does you know easy math. And at that point, that's, that's fine, but I, that's not what I want to do. I want, let's say, seven to go to the high school. I want three to go to the um, uh, middle school. And then I want two to go to the elementary. That's what I want. And again, um, I want to check that my math here goes with what my total items were originally on the uh, total number, my total quantity basically on the uh, tag. And then my cost, and you'll notice too, as I was changing these, it was also changing my original cost items for it, uh, which is really nice that it does all of the work for you. And so I, and then at this point, you know, if this was something where I had serial and model numbers, I could add that information in if I wanted to. Um, in this kind of case, because I'm still bunching them together um, per location, my biggest concern here is making sure that I have the right location codes. And so I am just going to pick one for fun here. Let's say this is the gym in the first and the high school. And let's say this is, I'm going to pick on. Here's the, let's say this is the gym for um, the middle school. And let's say this is the gym for the elementary. There we go. Um, and so at this point then, looking through seven plus three plus two equals 12. There's my total original cost. If I added all this up, yeah, it looks like 30,000 to me. Um, and then here, I do have a projection here. Um, where, you know, I can validate this first and run a projection report if I wanted to. I'm going to validate my input. If, like I said, I wanted to run a projection report first, I can. Um, and if I click split item, it will produce a projection. So let's just do that to be on the safe side before we go for it here. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And here it pops up. Um, the projection, and it even tells me that up at the top. This is a projection report. So you're basically taking this original tag and you're going to split it amongst these three tags. Seven are going to go to this location, three to this, and two to this. So 30,000 originally, 30,000 for my projection. That looks great. I can, you know, exit out of that. And now I'm going to uncheck the projection and click on the actual split item run. And again, it's gonna produce another report. And this time around, the projection isn't showing here. Um, this is the actual true and it, the, the information is basically the same. So if I wanted to go in then and look at those, 
Um, and for me, I always cheat and pull in the copy the tag number because I can never remember. And I go ahead and, and close out of here. Um, the original tag is is gone. You know, it, it's been dissolved or absorbed into these three split item tags. So um, if I go and try to query on that original tag, it's no longer going to be there. Um, but I can go in and, oh, it is smart enough. I brought them up. So here are my actual tags that it's split into now. Um, and so you can see then the amounts here. We can see the numbers. Everything looks good. And, and the locations are the correct locations of where these tags are at. So, um, so pretty easy uh, process. I think it's just when, if they don't do it very often, they just kind of have to think through the steps. Uh, but hopefully that kind of helps familiarize yourself, especially uh, for those of you that, that are on the call that you know, aren't in inventory a whole lot or it's very new to you, um, just to see how a split is done is helpful for you. Any questions on that before I move on to a split and disposing of part of the split? Okay. I'm gonna clear out of this and I'm gonna pick on another tag just to do something different. And as you can see, um, looking at this tag right away on the grid, um, it's old. You know, it was acquired back in 1996, but it is still active. These these uh, desks are still being in use. Well, we thought all of them, but we want to dispose of part of them. I'm going to view this just so we can see that there are 35 uh, desks that are going to be, um, and some of those are going to be disposed of. Like, how how do I do that? Um, you know, your district calls and says, yeah, I've got this one. I just need to dispose 10 of them. Um, how do I do this? Well, you're going to have to split them out and then you're going to be able to split it and basically dispose a part of that. So one thing to keep in mind is this tag number here. I don't want to change that. I want to leave the 25 with this tag, but I want the other 10 to go to a separate tag that, that I can then dispose of. Um, and so I'm going to use the split. And in this then, one thing that we have to keep in mind is, like I said before, is um, if 200502 or 503 is already being used and I try to, you know, just use 502 as, as the uh, starting number and I flip this into two, I'm going to get an error because 503 is already on file. So I kind of want to bypass this and I'm going to show you how to do that. I'm just going to add an A because uh, tag numbers can be numeric or alphanumeric. Um, and, um, and that's going to, and then I'm going to show you how I'm going to work around this so that I can still use 200502 as the original tag. So first thing it's checking is, is this valid? And, you know, will it work for, you know, both of these tags? So I'm going to validate. And it says, yeah, you're good to go. Proceed. Well, um, this is where I don't want to split this out because what it would do is split this tag out into two separate tags and, and it would split out that number 35 and try to split that out. And I don't want that. I want to keep 25 shares and dispose of 10. So I'm going to edit this. And here is where um, I can get away with um, going in and saying, you know, for my original tag, I want to leave that tag as is, but I want 25 to stay in um, inventory. I, you know, these are still active chairs or desks, I'm sorry, desks that I'm using. But for the other one, I'm gonna, one that I wanna dispose of, I'm gonna make that 200502A and I'm gonna make that 10. And you'll notice while I'm doing this, it's doing all the math for me. And everything is looking pretty good. I may have to refresh this one, but uh, because the number down here doesn't look quite right. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and cancel out of here for a sec. I'll try that again. Isn't it fun? We can see what, what things we find when we're doing this. My number of items is 35. All right, so let me split that again. 
And I have to use something other than this because I'm splitting into two. And then I am going to um, use the projection. So again, my max is still 35, validate. And then I want to edit this. And right now it does say 35. And so if I go in and like I said, change this to A and change this back to the original number, and then I change this to 25 and change this to 10. I'm not sure why that total is showing 42. I'm gonna mark that down though so we can kind of see what's going on here. Let's see what happens. Um, I'm gonna try to just refresh and see what it does here. Yeah, it just took it back to where it was. Okay, that's all right. Um, the amount here is correct. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a validation first. And that's okay. So it's liking what it sees in here. And you notice now it changed it back to 35. So I'm not quite sure where we got, why the 42 um, kind of did that, but it kind of tricked us a little bit. But once I validated it, everything looks good now. Um, but you'll notice too that again, you know, my starting number, what I had to put in in order to split it, um, I had to put in that A, but then I was sneaky and went back in and removed that A. I don't want it to be two entirely different tag numbers. I want to leave that original tag with 25. And then the part I want to dispose of, yeah, I'll use A as my tag number, add that onto it. Um, and at this point, then I'm going to do the split projection. Let's take a look at that report and looks good here. I have my original 35. Now I have the two, my existing, which will now have 25 instead of 35. And the other tag that's going to get created that I'm going to dispose of after this. And so the amounts match up to what they were originally. That all looks good. So I'll go ahead and run the actual. And again, same report. And now go in and look at this. And this now reflects 25 with the new amount. So that all looks great. And this one is the one with 10 items. So we can view that for the 950. This is the one now that I want to dispose of. And so I'm basically just going to go into the dispositions. And select the A. Put in a date for our 20 fiscal year 24, since that's what I'm in. And, and then fill out any other necessary information I need. Um, let's say that they are just junk. Um, so I'm going to leave that. They were destroyed. And then I'm going to click on create. And if I go back then and look at that tag underneath the items grid, um, it should give me a status of disposed of. This wasn't a capitalized asset, so it's not going to affect my gap uh, reports in any way. Um, if I go back to the item again, you'll see now that that split is now showing as disposed of. So that is a way to basically take a portion of a lot of an existing item, split it off and dispose of it. So that's kind of the way to do that. And what I, like I said, what I really like about that split feature is the ability to control the number of items. So I can be very specific. I think in classic, it's been a while, but I think in classic, we had to do a percentage and say, you know, you, you couldn't just say 14 chairs or 12 chairs. You had to come up with a percentage that was pretty darn close um, and figure that out. Like you had to change the number of items to 100 to reflect 100% and then try to split it off percentage wise. So this is so much better uh, than what it was in classic. Okay. Any questions about that one? Splits are fun. I could do splits all day. <laughs> all right. 
Um, okay, re-adding an item that was disposed of. Um, so I guess we'll just pick on that one that we just did. So, um, and I'm just gonna talk about this uh, because the steps to do it are, are um, there is so much to it. Um, but if, and I guess I'm just gonna step back here and just kind of show you like the grid um, because you'll notice when I selected that particular one, I got my, my uh, delete option is active. Because I did this disposition in the current year, it's going to allow me to delete that disposition. And I believe we have this in the FAQs as well. Um, so if the disposition date is in an open and in, in current, that's what we have here, you can delete it. And that's going to go ahead. And what happens is when you delete the disposition, it's um, it's it's deleted, you know, so it's not out there anymore. You can see it in an audit report, but you can't get to it anymore because it's deleted. The item then is still there, but it just changed the status now back to active. So it no longer shows disposed of, it just is active. But you'll see for these ones where the delete option is grayed out, um, it's because it's in a prior period um, and I can't just go in and delete those um, so or or delete the disposition. It's been in a prior year. It's it's been disposed of. Um, so I'm not able to go in and just um, delete the disposition. OK. You'll see, too, that the edit is in here as well. And, um, and, you know, some of these are very old and it's like, what am I editing on an old disposition? Um, there are only certain things you can. Obviously, you can't change the date. You know, the item stays intact, doesn't even give you an option to, to mess around with the item. But you'll notice here you can not change the disposition code if you needed to, if it was coded incorrectly. You know, you did some last year and you're like, Ugh, those weren't sold, those were destroyed, um, you know, you can go in and make those changes. You can do it in a spreadsheet and update those and mass update those dispositions. Um, in our uh, documentation, we do have a chapter underneath system underneath the import option that allow you to do that. Um, but, you know, you can also see that you, if you did get some money for that and you forgot to track it, um, got to put it in here, you can go in and edit that, and also who authorized it. So those are the only three things you can change in here. It's just basically, you know, just additional information. Those items aren't going to affect anything on the system per se. So not like a date or, you know, any of the uh, fund function asset cloak or, you know, or the cost. So it's just more bookkeeping type of things uh, that you can change. Okay, any questions on disposing or deleting a disposition? Pretty easy stuff there. But while we're in here, um, our next topic is talking about the air adjustments. And I know we touched upon those earlier when we were doing that acquisition. We wanted to not reopen a period, but we wanted it to be reflected on the gap schedules that that additional acquisition was really supposed to be done in a prior period. I want to talk about that air adjustment uh, option in a little more detail and when you would, you know, where those amounts come from. So the one that I showed earlier about the acquisition, definitely it's going to show an amount on the adjustment column on the gap schedule. Uh, because I'm in dispositions here, I just want to show you this is another reason reason why an amount would show in the adjustment. If I wanted to dispose of an asset, but it was supposed to be done last year, let's say, you know, we found out, oh gosh, we sold this um, in 2023. Um, well, I'm in 2024 right now. Do I really want to go in and reopen 2023 just to post a disposition and reclose again? I don't want to do that. And actually, I just want to go into my current year and dispose of it. Um, 
but my concern is it's a capitalized asset and I don't want it to show as a true disposition this year on my gap schedule. I would rather it show as in the adjustment column. Well, this is where you can make it and this is why it would show in the adjustment column. If I went in and created that disposition, pulled in the item, <clears throat> and obviously I have to put current year uh, for this disposition, but it really should have been disposed of last year. What I can do is click on the air adjustment. And so what happens then when I run that gap report, that amount is not gonna be included in the disposition column. It's going to be included in the adjustment column. So auditors are looking at that. What are these adjustments coming from? Well, <clears throat> this could have been um, uh, you know, a, a disposition that I marked as an error adjustment. And I believe on, I could be wrong here. It's been a while since I've been in here. You can, yes, you can add the error adjustment to your grid um, and then filter on that, you know, and then filter by the year. And you can say, these are the, the items that make that up. And that's why, you know, those amounts are reflected on the um, gap schedule because I created error adjustments. I marked them as error adjustments when I was creating those dispositions because they really should have been disposed of in a prior year. Um, and then you'll see with, Transfers, same thing. If I did a transfer transaction and it really should have been done in a prior year, when I create that transfer, I've got the ability to do an error adjustment on that. And again, I could go in and mark that on the grid for those to show um, so I can filter on those. And the same thing with the acquisitions. That's the one we talked about earlier. If I do create an additional acquisition, whether I do it in the acquisition grid or via the items grid, again, I can, excuse me, I can check the error adjustment and then that item will not appear on the um, acquisitions column on my change schedule. It'll appear on the adjustments column. So those are, you know, three reasons right away why you would have amounts on the adjustments column. Oops on your um, change schedule. I think I might have a couple more here. Let me review. Um, another reason that it could show on the adjustments column is let's say you went in and created an item. And, uh, and I think we talked about this one earlier too. When uh, we we created an item in a prior year and you added an additional acquisition to it, um, again, that and it made it capitalized um, when you did the upgrade to it. So again, that's going to show the like that we were using that eight thousand and four thousand dollar amount. The four thousand will show on the um, acquisition column and the 8,000 is going to show on the adjustment column. It's not gonna be in the beginning balance because it was not a capitalized asset at the beginning of the year. You have now made it a capitalized asset. So again, that's another reason why you're going to see something in the adjustment column, that remaining amount of that um, item um, that wasn't part of the additional acquisition you did is going to be reflected in that adjustment column. Uh, again, and you can do vice versa there too. Let's say I have an item that was capitalized and now it is no longer, um, I created um, a negative acquisition, thus decreasing the original cost of the item so that it's no longer capitalized. Again, when I'm looking at my, pull that back up here. my schedule of change to fixed assets, you have to remember in that case where you have decreased the original cost of the item during the year so that it's no longer capitalized, that amount was originally in the beginning value, right? I had a, a $15,000 item and I decreased it by 6,000. Now it's under my $10,000 threshold. So now it's $9,000. Um, and so by doing that, that you know, $15,000 was in here, you created an acquisition to cause it to be um, no longer capitalized. 
in the GAP schedule, that entire amount, that $15,000, is going to show on the adjustment amount. Um, it's going to take the whole thing off to say, hey, you had it here at the beginning, you did an adjustment, and it's going to be, um, it's going to uh, reduce that and basically remove it from the gap schedule for the year. So, but it's, you know, showing the changes during the year of what happened. Um, so obviously when the new year starts, it's no longer going to be included in uh, the gap schedule anymore because it's no longer a capitalized asset. So those are just some of the reasons, you know, if, um, you know, they're, you know, maybe auditors inquiring, you know, what are these amounts on the um, adjustment column for? I said, it could be because you physically checked the error adjustment and you can find that out by filtering on these grids or there's a change in the capitalization of that item, whether it's positive or negative that caused those amounts to show up on the adjustment. Okay. And I do believe we have all of that listed in our FAQs. Um, it's just something that, you know, you don't get questions very often for. I mean, we do have in the FAQs, but still it's not, it doesn't happen. Um, but when we do get a question, you know, we think, well, maybe we should put this on the FAQs because, uh, you know, they may run into this sometime. Um, but yeah, I think it details all of that in there. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is, um, why an item may not be showing up on the pending items grid. So if I go to transactions and go to pending items, um, here are all my pending items, and I probably don't have a whole lot marked on this grid, but um, but you know, if you get a, a call from one of your districts saying, you know, I why isn't this showing up? You know, I did the poll from USAS and it's not pulling it in. Well, you know, they have to kind of remember that that's all getting tracked in USAS, um, depending on what their pending threshold is in USAS. And what we have, if you weren't aware of this, is we do have a little communication table here between USAS and inventory in the pending items chapter that discusses um, what happens, you know, when an item is marked for inventory in USAS when it gets pulled, uh, when the actual, you know, pulled into the uh, inventory, when it gets created, posted as a tag in inventory, is it still talking to USAS? Absolutely. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to go over this table with you guys, um, just for it to make a little more sense. So when you're invoicing an item in USAS, um, and it does meet the pending threshold amount. Maybe you've got it marked, you know, for 600 object codes for $500. Um, and so obviously USAS is going to track that then. And you post that invoice and it marks that item to say that it's for inventory or for, I think I might even say EIS. Um, and so what it does is it marks it with an USAS inventory status of pending. And so when you pull the items in inventory, when you use uh, the pull from USAS option, and I'll show you where that's at here, right here. So when you use this option then, it's going to go out there and find any of those uh, it, um, invoices from uh, USAS that have an inventory status of pending, and it's gonna pull them in. So once those get pulled in then, and they're sitting on the actual inventory pending items grid, it's going to update the status to sent in USAS. So I know it's kind of like a behind the scenes type of thing, um, but it does go out there and update that to sent. So if you try to pull again, it, you've already pulled it and it won't pull it again. So you won't get duplicates on your pending items grid and inventory. Um, so it changes it to sent. So when I'm in inventory now and I'm you know, creating a tag and I pull that item in from my pending items grid and I create the tag, it not only updates things in inventory, it goes back to USAS 
and it updates that inventory status in USAS to post it. So again, to say, yeah, you went in and you created an item in inventory for this, cool. I'm gonna now change this to, from sent to posted. Um, that way too, again, if you do the pull from USAS, it won't pull that back in again because it's you've already created a tag for it. Um, this last one is um, if the pending file, um, pending item is deleted from the pending items grid. So you deleted that item from the pending items grid. It still goes back and talks to USAS and says, I know you, know, you sent this to me, um, but now I've deleted it off of the pending items grid. So we update the status from sent to rejected in USAS. Now in the pull from USAS option, you know, you can, you know, put in a starting date. And if you really wanted to re-pull that rejected item back in, you would click on this and it would take those with that rejected status in, in USAS and pull them back into the, so you do have the option of pulling those back in. Um, but I, you know, I feel like this is a good starting point to talk to your districts as to why those aren't pulling in. And it really is based on, you know, what the status is of that item. And we do have some information down here on finding those items that have, um, you know, those statuses. We've got a report here where you can pull that and see what the actual inventory status is here. So, um, so this is a report definition that you can import into USAS and run. And that's nice. So, you know, you put in, uh, uh, you can just pull in all, all of the ones that are marked that have some kind of marking for inventory is true and you'll be able to see all of those so that's a good starting point too to say okay let's go out there and use this and take a look to see why they aren't pulling well, that's because you've already created a tag for it and you know it's showing the status is posted so this is one thing you could do um, we do have an advanced query too where you could go in and look at those items through the AP invoice uh, option in USAS and pull an advanced query uh, results from that as well. So I think this is really a good starting point when you do get those questions from your districts. I don't, why isn't it coming in? And 99% of the time it's because of some kind of status. Um, but obviously if, um, you know, you guys have checked all of that, still can't figure out why it's not getting pulled in, um, then, you know, create a ticket and we can help you guys out with that. Now, oh, one other thing, um, or the next thing I wanted to talk about is just construction in progress. And it's not so much of, you know, how, you know, what do I do to, to add them? Um, it's just that, you know, how, I mean, why would I add them the way that I, you know, is, is it, does it depend on what the auditors tell me? Does it depend on, you know, just a decision by the district on how they want to track them? And it is, I mean, they could, you know, consult with their auditors beforehand when they start a, a construction and progress project to say, okay, I'm going to have all of these items here for the project. Do I track them on a spreadsheet? Do I track them in inventory? You know, um, what do you, what do you recommend? Um, because I just wanted to show you what you could do in order to track them in inventory. And I'm just going to pull up, I think I have some existing CIP. And um, CIP items are should be denoted with an asset class of O starting with an 08, whether the district makes it 08 or 0800, it's a max of four uh, digits. Um, but yeah, what they can do is go in and um, they can create those items if they want to in inventory um, using you know the items option and marking them with an asset class of 0800. And when they do that, um, CIP isn't, um, depreciation isn't being tracked on that yet uh, because it's not considered an actual item because the building is not open yet per se. Um, so, you know, when it comes to um, depreciation information on those items, you wanna leave that information blank. You wanna say no to depreciation until, you know, it is an actual item that's in use. Uh, for the district. Um, 
And so uh, that way it's not included in, um, you know, in yeah, depreciation based reports, book value report and stuff like that. If it truly isn't being, it isn't in use yet. Um, and I think uh, one question that, you know, we've received in the past is, do I create an individual item for every CIP item that I'm tracking, or can I lump them together as several acquisitions on one item? Well, that's, you know, that's up to the district. Um, and, you know, the, the advice probably uh, from their auditors as to what they want to do. Um, if it's like, I don't know, architect fees, where you don't want a separate item for architect fees, maybe you want to lump it all into one tag, then you would create that tag with the CIP asset class um, and you would just add additional acquisitions onto that for all of the POs that have uh, been paid for um, architect fees. So you could have you know, 12 different purchase order items regarding architect fees, pull that in as 12 different acquisitions under one tag. Um, and again, you would create the item and then use that add acquisition option to add those, the rest of those um, in. And they all would be marked under the 0800 asset class. Um, and then when the time comes where, you know, you want to make it part of the building, you can just do a transfer transaction to transfer that asset class from an 0800 to an 02 or an 0200. Um, that way then it shows as part of the building um, and not uh, construction in progress anymore. So um, that's one thing you could do, but if you prefer to actually go in and um, create separate uh, tags for each one, that's fine too. Um, so it's just, you know, it's just a conversation that the district has to have with their auditor, um, their construction project manager on what's the best, best option for them how they want to track these. They could do some where they have multiple acquisitions under one item, or they could just do separate um, items. You know, if they're talking about bigger ticket information, um, actual tangible assets. I ordered, um, you know, a bunch of lockers and stuff like that for the new building, stuff like that. If they wanted a lot of those lockers as one take, great. But if they wanted to track all of their um, whiteboard separately, they can create uh, separate items for that, all marked underneath um, the CIP until it's time, and then they would do uh, transfer transactions to move them over to fixtures, furniture, equipment, building, whatever asset class it needs to go under. Uh, another question that we have gotten, um, and it, it seems like we get this question every once in a while, but it's a it's a good one because it does impact um, your reports. And um, it's when I, you know, mark an item for inventory, I create that item, you know, the fund, what am I using as the fund number? Am I using the fund number that was used when I purchased that item? Um, and as people just aren't quite sure what they um, should enter in as the fund. And usually I know, you know, just looking, you know, at, you know, at districts um, inventory data, a lot of them um, will, you know, whatever the fund was, the, the purchase fund is also the fund number on the item, but that's not always the case. Um, the fund number that you record when you actually create an item, and I'll just pick one. Uh, an item here. Go ahead and click on this one. So the fund number here is really where it's being used. So if you purchased an item using grant money, maybe ESSER funds or something like that, where it was purchased from a grant, but it's really used in the athletic building or a piece of athletic equipment. Um, your acquisition will show the ESSER fund, maybe I think that's a 507 fund, but your actual item is going to be whatever that fund is that you're using it for. So if it's you know in the elementary building um, or you know or part, I'm sorry, part of the general fund, 
then you would put in 001 because that's where it's being used. If it is um, part of a vehicle purchase, then your fund would probably be, you know, a, a fund number that you're using for that. Um, so it just depends on um, what you're using the item for. That's what this fund code would be for. Um, I think I have an example here. I'm going to pick on a better one than this. So here's an example of some benches, weight benches that were purchased for the athletic account um, or for the athletic building. Um, and so in here, um, if I actually look at the item and then the items right here, um, the fund is student activities. It's a 300 fund. Um, but it was really purchased with a grant fund. So remember, the acquisition is your purchase order information, what you purchased it for. So if I took a look at that same tag in here, you'll notice that it's not a 300 fund here. I purchased it with a 507 fund. So it was purchased with some grant money. Um, so when I created the acquisition, you know, um, or when I created the item and I pulled it from the pending file, you know, it was purchased with this. But actually, when I started then to go in and finish the item um, and was down at the fund uh, field, I want to put in where is this currently being used? Well, really, it's being used as a student activity. So I'm going to put a 300 here. And, you know, what, you know, so you're thinking, okay, well, what the, what does that affect? Well, um, this is, you know, the, this is the source fund and this is the where it's used fund. And we do have certain reports that reflect those differently. And the two reports, the first one, if it's a capitalized asset, the fixed asset by source, that tells you right there, this is showing you um, and it'll reflect where the item was purchased from. So it's not going to show up under the 300 on this report. It's going to show up under the 507 because that's my source fund where it was purchased from. Um, another one um, is the asset listing by grant source. That's another one where, you know, you can, it, it'll show you both. It'll show you on there the uh, fund that it was purchased from. So I'm going to see that 507. Then I'm going to see what we call the item fund. Um, so, and that's going to be my 300 fund. So you've got acquisition fund, which is your source fund where you purchased it from. And you have item fund, which is where it's being used. And that's what's showing up on the item portion. Um, and it is, it's, you know, the, the district's um, call on, on how they track all of that stuff. But um, I think sometimes people, you know, just kind of question that, like, okay, am I, am I using this? Where am I using this? And, you know, based off of our conversations with the Otter States office as well, um, it's the, um, you know, when you're adding it as an item in inventory, it's where is that item being used? And so even though it was purchased from a grant, it's in the 300 fund because it's part of athletics, it's part of student activities. Okay. Any questions about the source fund versus the item fund? Okay, just a couple more here, wrap it up. Um, deleting items, and you know, we get this uh, question every once in a while, but I think it just kind of trips people up a little bit because deleting an item um, is not disposing of an item, right? So if you dispose of an item, you have to create a disposition transaction and it changes the status of the item on the items grid to just from active to disposed of, but it doesn't get rid of the item. If you go in and truly delete an item um, and uh, you know some of these are old non-capitalized assets here, why they're marked um, with that as active, um, it's going it's going to delete it. It's gone. It's off the system. You can see it on the audits report. That's the only trace you have left that it's, you know, or, or explaining why you deleted it. Um, but I know some people have said, can I get that back? No. Um, 
can I get it pulled into the pending file? No, I mean, because think about that, when that was pulled in, you know, it's at that status of saying it's posted. It was a tag that was created. So if you try to repull from that time frame, it's not gonna let you because of the status in um, USAS is stating that it's uh, posted. So it's not pending, it's been done, you know, um, it's already been created as a tag. You accidentally deleted it. Only way to react to only way to get it back on the system is to re-add it manually. Uh, you can't pull it from the pending file. I think we might have a feedback issue. We do. Feedback, I, I know I put that down here somewhere. Feedback 58. Um, so to allow posted pending items to be added back into the pending file if the tag was deleted. I know, you know, try to save time um, because what they're going to have to do is they're probably going to have to go in, pull the PO, take a look at the information on that purchase order, say, okay, what do I need to add in again? Um, but yeah, I mean, the only choice when you delete uh, an item from inventory is to add it back in. Disposing of it, you accidentally dispose, you know, disposed of it and you need to make it active again, that's easy. You can just go into the dispositions and delete that disposition. And the item, you know, is still out there, but it just changes it back to active for you. So really not a whole lot of work involved. Um, I think I've got one more here. Donating. Um, and we do get this uh, every so often. And people just aren't quite sure what needs to be done when you donate, when they donate. And um, I know that some, they, you know, there's a car uh, that somebody donates to uh, the school district. What do I do with that? Well, you know, um, you, you know, you want to record it on the system. And um, when you're adding that item, you're going to use the fair market value of that item as the original cost. And so when you think about that, um, I'm going to go ahead and just click on create here. Um, obviously, there's nothing to pull from, from the pending item. So you're just going in and creating, you know, the item I'm just going to pick on uh, a number here. And it is an acquisition, you know, you have acquired it. Um, and, uh, you know, you put in whatever the date is, go back to the year I'm in, uh, the account code, you can leave blank. It's, you didn't purchase this, this was donated. So this can remain empty. Um, obviously there's no vendor or purchase order information. So I'm just gonna put in the amount of the fair market value of that car. And I continue to the item and, you know, and then I, Put in the rest of my information you need to put in uh the fund the function the asset class of where it's being used obviously it's not um anything that you purchased and you know for these um particular fields you're you know want to put in where it's being used at so you would select those and i think the biggest thing out of this um, is the acquisition method you know you have to make sure that you put donated on here um, to record this item as a donated item. So I just kind of want to explain, you know, what I know some people are asking, what exactly, what, where, what should I put on the item? You know, I know I need to mark it as donated, but what about the rest of this? Yeah. And when it comes to the acquisition, there's not a whole lot to it because you didn't purchase it. Um, and then when it comes to actually filling out the rest of the item window here, where is it being used for the fund function asset class? and you know, making sure that your acquisition method is set as donated. Okay, if there's anything else. That is all I had to cover today, um, but I'm you know, welcoming any questions that you guys have at this time on, on certain you know, inventory things that um, you aren't quite sure about. Um, and we can... Uh, you can tackle those. Anyone have any questions? Okay. You guys are quite gripped today. Soaking it all in. Like I said, um, 
that will, you know, thank you. Um, all that information is, you know, or some of this is in the FAQs. Um, so, you know, you can look up some of this information in here, um, point your districts to some of this, you know, if they're asking about it, it should be in there as well as, you know, what we have in the documentation here. And um, I'm trying to see what we have next, coming up next here. We do have recaps coming up next. Can't believe, like I said, we're in October already. Uh, next week, we're going to cover that. And then also just um, a reminder for those that are hosting for us. Again, we so appreciate that. Meta, Maveka, and Swoka <clears throat> are hosting our fall SSD Direct. So if you know you have a district that is close to one of those ITCs and they want to get their fill of USAS and payroll information, um, the you know we're gonna post a newsletter with a reminder on Monday, um, but the link's out there in the wiki and uh, have your district sign up for that. Um, otherwise, um, October is a little quiet month just because we have all of this training. We're also going to be at the Support Con uh, conference. We are doing a learning labs there. So if you have districts, uh, support staff that are attending that, um, please have them uh, attend our session. We're doing two hours on Thursday um, and we're gonna cover an hour with USAS tips and tricks and an hour with payroll tips and tricks. So we'll be there as well. So yeah, we kind of had to take a break in October with training just because we are out and about or out you know, physically at uh, doing presentations and trainings all around the state. So, um, so we're excited about it and um, and uh, it just depends too if if uh, we feel I know ESS is always in the back of everybody's mind, especially mine. Um, and uh, if uh, we feel that we need to have another ESS like touch base session, I will probably can squeeze that in in the month of October. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where we're at right now for uh, the next month. So thanks you guys for hanging on with me this morning, and I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you.